Okay, welcome everyone. Um, buonasera, um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Fabiola Tosi and I'm the Assistant Director of Programs at the Italian Cultural Institute of Chicago. Uh, tonight we're joined by Professor Laura Gagliardi and Consul General Thomas Bottius uh, for a lecture that will take us deep into the exploration of solutions for sustainable resources. Uh, this lecture follows the celebration of the Italian Research Day in the world, which every year on April 15 uh, highlights the fundamental contribution of Italian scientists and researchers uh, working uh, with the international scientific community. The Day of Italian Research was established in 2018 by the Italian Minister of Education, University and Research in partnership with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Health. And the date represents the anniversary of the birth of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, so before we move on with the introduction of our speaker, I will leave the floor to our Consul General for some remarks. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiola. Buonasera, everyone. I'm very glad to welcome all of you to this webinar uh, celebrating the fifth edition of the Italian Research Day. And uh, I'm particularly grateful to Professor Laura Gagliardi for taking our invitation. Uh, allow me just some brief remarks to remind us, Fabiola already did, that the Italian Research Day is a format organized worldwide by the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs through the network of Italian embassies and consulate uh, worldwide. Here in the United States, uh, under the coordination of the embassy in Washington, DC, a total of 10 events this year will be held across the nation or have already been organized. Uh, with the Italian Research Day, we celebrate science, research and innovation as key pillars of Italy-US relations in tackling global challenges. And in my opinion, it is also a simple way to celebrate and say thank you to the many Italian scientists and researchers who have dedicated their studies and activities to this mission. Whether we talk about pandemics, climate change, responsible and sustainable use of natural resources, international security, food and water accessibility, reinventing modern cities and territories, building respectful and inclusive societies with equal opportunities for everyone and tackling any form of discrimination. It is clear that most of the answer must come from science and the scientific approach is needed to assess and address the challenges that we have ahead of us. With this web webinar in particular, we are going to focus on one of these topics, producing sustainable energy solutions is and will be more and more crucial for the same future of our planet and the well-being of future generations. So I really thank you again, Professor Laura Gagliardi, and thank all of you. I wish all of us an interesting evening. Ciao. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Shall I uh, start? Um, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to introduce oh, yes, of course. you, of course, of course, uh, of course, to our public. Um, but first of all, I want to also to remind everyone that after the lecture, we'll have time for some questions. Uh, so feel free to leave them in the Q and A tab at the bottom of your of your screen anytime during the lecture, and we'll get to those later. Um, so uh, Laura Gagliardi uh, is the Richard and Kathy. Leventhal Professor of Chemistry and Mo Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. Uh, she was born and raised in Italy, earned her PhD in theoretical chemistry at the University of Bologna in 1997. She was then postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge in UK. Uh, Gagliardi became an assistant professor at the University of Palermo in, in 2002. In 2005, she became associate professor at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And in 2009, she joined the University of Minnesota as professor of chemistry. In 2020, she joined the University of Chicago. Gagliardi is a theoretical quantum chemist who is internationally known for her contributions to the development of electronic structure methods and their use for understanding complex chemical systems. She is an elected member of the USA National Academy of Sciences, 
uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Academia Europea, and Academia de Linge. So please join me in welcoming Professor Laura Gagliardi. And thank you again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fabiola, for this kind introduction. And thank you also to our console, uh, Thomas Bozios. It's really a honor for me to be here. And um, uh, I'm very excited to share with you some of the research that we are performing uh, um, here at the University of Chicago. So can I just ask uh, Fabiola, can you see my slide? Is, is that okay? Everything yes, okay. Perfect. Okay, great. So um, um, I just uh, would like to start saying that, so uh, I will tell you about uh, um, this research that we are performing, which is uh, um, consists of uh, doing some chemical modeling, and hopefully I will explain to you what this means uh, towards uh, the design uh, of a sustainable energy future. And uh, uh, before uh, I start, I'd like to um, to show this uh, this image. It's uh, the world in uh, many colors, uh, many diverse colors. And uh, what I like uh, uh, to show is that it's embraced by one of these uh, molecular material structures that we are studying, showing that uh, science and engineering are really global. Uh, they allow different people from different countries, uh, 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 diverse in many respects, uh, to work together to speak a common language of science. And this is really a privilege, especially considering what is going on uh, right now uh, in our world. So I want to... Um, to start uh, um, dedicating this uh, this talk to my mother, who um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, you have heard about my career path. But um, uh, what I really am um, very grateful is that uh, I am a scientist. I'm very uh, excited about science, and um, one of the reasons why I decided to become a scientist is thanks to my mother. She tried to connect from Italy. Of course, she she, she went to the panelist uh, link instead of the public link, but I told her that uh, in case she cannot connect now, it's 1 a.m. in the morning, She tomorrow she will get the recording. And uh, she was uh, she, she's now retired. She was a math teacher. She has always encouraged me to um, to work with passion uh, and uh, uh, probably she has also um, inspired the curiosity towards the science that I have. And uh, in the picture that uh, I showed you before, uh, she was uh, reading a, a book that um, um, I, I, have it, I have with me all the time, La Chiave a Stella by uh, Primo Levi, The Ranch. And, uh, and I really like this sentence uh, uh, in Italian for the Italian in the in the crowd l'amare il proprio lavoro che purtroppo è privilegio di pochi costituisce la migliore approssimazione concreta alla felicità sulla terra ma questa è una verità che non molti conoscono and then later on it's my attempt to translate some important um, paths and I would like to say that in this respect I feel very um, lucky and privileged because the science uh, uh, is able to give uh, um, me but I, I think in general to scientists this kind of enthusiasm uh, for um, our own uh, work and so to uh, to just uh, put a little bit of introduction about what I'm doing so I um, I am a computational uh, chemist or computational material Material science, which means that uh, we, we study chemical and materials um, problems, but uh, exclusively on the computer. So we do um, simulations and uh, uh, we are studying phenomena related to um, sustainable energies. Here, um, there are some examples. So for example, we, we look at these uh, um, complex uh, uh, framework structures and we study reactions and look at uh, possible um, so-called catalysts that make the reaction occur um, more effectively. We study, and this is what I'm going to talk about today, uh, separations of gas and uh, water harvesting. Also, what is very important are, are quantum materials that can be used to 
um, form quantum computers. And uh, in the bottom, what you see is an example of a, a possible photovoltaic material. So the idea is to, to perform these simulations on the computer, um, either to understand um, phenomena that uh, are experimentally detected or to make predictions and uh, uh, predict uh, uh, superior systems for these applications before they have been uh, um, uh, made and studied in the expert in the laboratory. And so all this, uh, I mean, even if these are very extended systems, very complex uh, materials, they are really build of uh, so-called uh, atoms and molecules. So we, we really start uh, at a very basic level, and I apologize for those of you who are uh, advanced uh, uh, scientists, but maybe if there are people who, are, who have studied chemistry only uh, many years ago in high school or at the beginning of their college degree, maybe this is, is a short review. And um, so molecules uh, um, are these um, objects that uh, are obtained by joining together atoms uh, through chemical bonds. And so here on the left, you see an example of some atoms uh, that form molecules, for example, the water molecule. Uh, and then here on the right, you see different types of molecules um, that go from maybe simpler ones with just two atoms, like the oxygen molecules, to more complex ones, for example, DNA or caffeine and, and so on. And uh, um, the question is, how small uh, are these molecules? We know that uh, all the world around us is formed by molecules. But to give you an idea, this is a um, a size a scale. So if the human plus a tennis ball is a, as an order of magnitude one meter in size, when we look at these atoms, so they are 10 to the minus 10 meters. So 10 orders of magnitude smaller than um, a human. And uh, this is also the, the dimension of a molecule. So we are working with very, very tiny objects, but understanding how nature, how matter um, works at this uh, dimension really allows you to explain a lot of the macroscopic phenomena that we um, see around us. Uh, however, so the question is, okay, we are interested in these molecular systems or assemble of molecules like the one that you see here. And this is what I'm going to talk later during the talk. So the question is, why do we have to use uh, computations? Why can't we just uh, do everything in the, in the lab? And so I have to tell you, personally, I choose computation because um, it's very, um, how to say, um, it's really something at the border between uh, uh, physics, uh, uh, math. So I had this uh, more theoretical inclination. But uh, um, the reason why this is important is that uh, because sometimes experimental measurements uh, provide only part of the picture. So we, we cannot measure everything. On the other hand, with the computer simulations, we can really fill information gaps, we can offer interpretation, so explain phenomena, and then suggest new targets before their synthesis. And this is really where uh, computations is important. We can predict many properties, uh, uh, and we are going to talk today a lot about uh, electronic properties, but also magnetic, vibrational fingerprints. And uh, when we study these phenomena at this really small scale, I told you 10 to the minus 10, um, we need to include a physics that uh, uh, probably, um, I mean, we, we don't uh, perceive at the macroscopic level. So we, we have to um, discuss a lot about how electrons uh, uh, interact among each other. And so to do that, we need uh, to use the fundamental laws of quantum mechanics. So I also want to make a, a, um, observation here. The fact that, for example, um, uh, I wrote here uh, offers interpretations and suggests new targets is extremely important, uh, not just um, for the fun of it, but because sometimes uh, uh, these experiments uh, are, are very expensive and uh, there are a lot of safety issues associated with them. And so if, uh, uh, as computationalists, we can uh, just tell our experimental colleagues, okay, it's, uh, it's better if you proceed in this direction 
uh, instead of the other, we really save a, a, a lot of work and uh, the advancement of knowledge proceeds uh, faster. So, but now we are at quantum mechanics. So, um, okay, okay, this is a, a lecture for a general public. So what is quantum mechanics? And uh, uh, so I, I prepared this uh, slide in which, uh, you know, I, I am uh, quite active on social media and uh, um, I have a wonderful nephew, I have a wonderful family in Italy. Uh, this picture is my, my nephew who is uh, 13, he lives in Milano. And uh, I tutored him uh, in chemistry uh, on Zoom. And this was uh, a few months ago. So he's 13, he's trying to understand. And so basically uh, here, what you, what you see is uh, to, to understand quantum mechanics, you really, I mean, or, or better, quantum mechanics is um, uh, explains the behavior of matter uh, really at the um, atomic uh, level. So looking at the nucleus and the electrons uh, uh, in the atoms. And, uh, um, and so the, the, the other aspect is that when we, so the, when we um, want to study these uh, systems, uh, um, uh, we really, as I said, we, uh, I will now talk about more um, materials applications related to the um, to sustainable energies. But the idea is that we we start from these uh, um, molecules and these uh, um, single molecules, and then we make nanostructures of them. Eventually, but this is more for more um, biological or um, yes, I would say biological phenomena. Or we go to this of scale and so we have for all these different scales um, to use a different uh, approaches and uh, today as I told you we are going to talk about uh, phenomena involving electronic effects so I'm going to talk uh, mainly about uh, methodologies involving quantum mechanicals or um, a combination of quantum and classical mechanical mechanics uh, to study these more kind of nanoscale uh, uh, systems. And here, yes, is my uh, one slide on uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, so the idea is the following, that, you know, in the um, classical world, we think that uh, we, ca we can reach a st a states of energies that vary in a continuous way. When, on the other hand, we are working with these super tiny little objects like atoms and molecules or nanostructures, um, the, the matter changes its energy, not in a continuous way, Way, but in these uh, quantum uh, jumps that are represented here by these, uh, for example, uh, electron shells uh, and, uh, and subshells. And so the, the laws uh, that we have to use uh, have to take into account these phenomena called uh, quantization. So now let's start talking about uh, the, um, the the challenge that uh, uh, I want to describe and on which uh, uh, we are working using uh, uh, approaches related to computational and quantum mechanics. So one big challenge that the entire world, the entire planet is facing is uh, what to do with the uh, carbon dioxide that uh, is produced and uh, creates this greenhouse effect especially if we think about the carbon dioxide that is produced by a, a power plant. So um, there is this uh, process called uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, abbreviated as CCS, uh, which means if you have a large stationary industrial source, like a power plant, one wants to capture this uh, CO2 before it's released in the atmosphere and then eventually uh, store or sequester it in deep uh, subsurfaces. And this is a, um, a example of how this, uh, this can happen, where you see uh, you, you obtain all this um, CO2 and then eventually is stored uh, um, underground. And so there are these two aspects of the process. And um, it's demonstrated that the capture is the most expensive part of the process. It's about 70% of the entire energy cost is due to the capture. Um, 
uh, and then there is also the, the geologic storage that involves uncertainties and risk uh, if considered uh, at full scale. So how uh, is this uh, capture done? I mean, it's, um, there are already, there are industrial processes uh, and uh, the idea is the following. Uh, you have your, uh, your power plant, these gases are emitted and they contain a lot of these molecules. And here they are just represented with different colors. And these are some of the molecules that contain. So there is water, there is hydrogen, nitrogen, methane, and there is CO2. And um, the idea would be to, to find a way to uh, capture CO2 and separate it uh, from all uh, the other molecules. But the challenge is due to the fact that these molecules are, are quite similar, for example, in their size, in their properties, and so it's very difficult uh, to separate them. And there are, of course, a lot of uh, uh, industrial processes in place, but the question is, can one envision um, more effective processes and also perhaps more sustainable processes? And so, um, one idea is to use uh, some materials uh, that are like sponges that really um, trap some of these molecules, in particular CO2, while they, they let the other molecules uh, go through. And so um, among these possible sponges, uh, um, a class of materials that is, uh, um, has uh, received uh, some attention, these are relatively new materials, they have been uh, invented within the last 20 years or so, are, co are materials called metal organic frameworks, MOFs. And this is a, um, a video that shows uh, um, how they form and what they are. So you see, these are sort of particular uh, structures uh, which have um, a part of the, the um, some components the one in red and green these are formed by metals and oxygen these are metal oxides and the part uh, uh, in, um, in gray this is a organic component it's called uh, um, so it's based on carbon and this is called an organic linker and so you have these uh, reticular structures that uh, here you have an example of one of these uh, um, moths that uh, uh, has been synthesized and what is very important is that uh, they are very compact but they have very large surface areas, even if they are so small. So in principle, if you could put on a surface, uh, all the, the internal surface of the of a moth, you could cover almost a, a soccer field, uh, uh, calcio, football in Italiano. They have very low density and the pore size um, can be tuned. So uh, one can really design them with different size of the pores. And then you have these channels so that are in one, two or three dimensions and the surface inside them can really be functionalized. A lot of chemistry can happen on this surface. And so some of the common applications are, for example, for hydrogen storage, gas separations, catalysis. And uh, so you could think about having one of these sponges uh, um, in principle in your, in your car um, to, to, to store hydrogen if you wanted to have a hydrogen car, for example. But uh, today we are going to talk about the you utilization of these sponges for um, CO2 capture. And so the, the idea is the following. For example, let's say that you have uh, a, um, a tank and you have a gas. So you could put uh, um, this sponge in your, um, in your bottle and uh, use it as a adsorbent for gas uh, storage. But uh, uh, you could also think about using these sponges, uh, the, the one that you see here in the middle of your, uh, of your reactor, um, to do uh, gas separation. So you, you put in a mixed gas with different components and uh, uh, the sponge uh, selectively uh, traps one of these components and then you purify your gas. And again, this uh, um, 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 separation, this, uh, the fact that the sponge uh, captures one of the components is based in, in exclusively on the chemical interaction, not exclusively, but in large part, the chemical interaction of your sponge with the component. So this seems to be a very attractive uh, um, technology. And the question that I also want to discuss with you as a theorist, as a computational person who wants to do everything on the computer, why are we so fascinated by this uh, uh, phenomena? 
And here you see, this is a, um, actually an image taken from a paper by one collaborator a few years ago. Uh, so the idea is that there are these uh, um, real, and by real we mean made in the lab sponges with their various components, the building blocks, some uh, metal oxides and some organic component. And so one in a computer can just um, really um, collect all this information about the building blocks and uh, allow the computational modeling to come up with some new hypothetical maps in which these components are combined in a way different compared to what uh, has, has already been done in the lab. And so one can come up with the unknown structures that uh, maybe the chemical intuition uh, in the lab um, would not have uh, predicted. Of course, then they have to be useful for a given application. But the, this idea of modular chemistry is really very attractive to people uh, who want to um, design things on a computer. So there is this particular metal organic framework. It has a, an awful name, MOF74. It's just a catalog name, in which uh, there are these, um, these cores that you see here in two dimension and three dimension. And here, the idea is that there are these metals, so they, they are the, um, the little stick that you see in green, and uh, um, the metal can be of different types. So this is, you see, again, at the molecular level with this microscope, microscope we look at the local structure, and there are these um, green atoms that are the metals, and they, they, they are not totally happy about their coordination. They have an empty coordination site due to the way in which the material has been synthesized. And in principle, some interesting chemistry can occur here. And so here, when we say metal is equal to one of this, one can look at the periodic table and think about different possible metals. And then what happens is that if you have your metal, uh, which has um, a vacancy, uh, in principle, a molecule like CO2 can come in and bind uh, to the metal. And here you see the, the various components of these materials. You see, so this is the, the metal oxide center, and then there are these uh, um, organic parts that uh, uh, link it to, to other metal oxides. And so, um, now there is a, the, the practical application. So the goal is to try to absorb CO2, for example, in the presence of water at a temperature that is uh, close to room temperature, a little higher. Let's say that it's a temperature uh, at which this power plant works. And here you see we have the, the amount of uh, CO2 absorbed for different uh, materials that are used. Uh, some of them have industrial application. And the first one here, it has this awful name, but this is nothing else that our material of interest, this uh, magnesium MOF 74. And so what is important here is that not just that these bars are very high, but we want uh, the material to be able to absorb um, a lot of CO2, but also in the presence of other gases. So for example, you see this is a, a zeolite, which is a more traditional material. It absorbs uh, CO2 very effectively, but only when it's just in the presence of pure CO2. But we want a material that is able to do also this selective adsorption in, a presence, in the presence of a multi-component uh, um, mixture. And this magnesium MOF74 does a really good job. So the, the questions for the theorist is, okay, uh, can we study not just magnesium, but also other transition metals and also, um, if we look at this particular topology, which metal is the best for CO2 uh, capture and why? Can we understand the, the fundamental theoretical reasons uh, behind the behavior so that we can predict the superior materials? And can we just in general be predictive? 
So here is where I want to give you an example of what the modeling can do. And here I just show you a couple of equations, not because I want you to, to, to just get into the details, but to explain that these are the type of uh, uh, equations that uh, uh, govern this kind of interactions, uh, for example, between the, the, the framework and the CO2. And one has to, to, um, to to use this kind of uh, um, math or physics uh, uh, to model these systems on the computer. And what I want to show you is that if, uh, so here this is a rather technical picture, but basically this shows the, the loading of, uh, of CO2 as a function of the pressure of the gas. And these are uh, data that one gets from some experiments. And uh, this point here represents the, the condition of the flue gas that comes out of the power plant. And if you do simulations with uh, classical methods, and classical means that are derived from classical physics, uh, you see the, the agreement between experiment and, uh, and simulations is not very good, which means that, uh, I mean, we, we cannot be predictive because if we do so poorly. So here is where in using instead the laws of quantum mechanics, because uh, at the end of the day, the interaction that governs the um, this, uh, um, the, 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 the interaction between CO2 and uh, these um, sponges uh, are mainly guided by, by quantum mechanics. So what uh, we do in my group, we try to develop model that uh, uh, should predict these behaviors, but based on the equations of, of quantum mechanics. And here I want to show you um, a work that was done a few years ago by one of my students, Alison Zubak. Now she's a professor. And uh, uh, you see here there is the what we are, we have the loading of CO2 as a function of the pressure. And um, these, uh, um, you see this uh, blue point represents the experimental curve. The, the green um, triangles represent what one can do with the classical uh, laws of physics, classical physics. On the other hand, here in red, this is the, our prediction based on quantum mechanics. And you see the agreement is substantially better at lower pressures when we go to higher pressures. So they, I mean, the, the phenomenon becomes more macroscopic. And so if we, we need to improve our model more, but clearly there is the superiority of quantum mechanics. And here you see also that the approach works very well also to predict um, nitrogen absorption. So now that we understand that we have a methodology that uh, um, is working, what we can do is uh, uh, now we are basically um, um, just confirming our methodology, uh, benchmarking it against experiment. We can use the same method uh, to make predictions on unknown systems. And so we have been looking at different uh, um, compositions of the gas, but also uh, different compositions of the materials. But now to, to give you an example uh, of how these uh, um, kind of approaches that uh, work in a powerful way, I want to describe you another important uh, um, societal challenge, which is, uh, I mean, our planet uh, uh, really is, is lacking uh, as, as a problem of water, especially in, um, in certain areas where there is not like in the Chicago area where perhaps we have a lot of lakes, but in the desert. And so another um, big challenge that uh, um, people are trying to, to deal with is atmospheric water harvesting. And so the idea would be if you are um, in an environment and there is um, some humid uh, vapor, you can capture it in your sponge and then uh, the vapor liquefies and uh, you get drinkable water. And so um, this is an application, um, uh, a, a problem, let's say that is very dear, for example, to, the, to, the, to DARPA, the army, because when they have the, the, the army, the soldiers in a dry climate, for example, in, in, the, in the desert, uh, it's, um, it's very challenging to make sure that the soldiers are constantly hydrated. So they have either to carry a lot of water, but then it uh, creates problems. And so the idea is, could uh, the soldier have a device, which is very small, and have it with them all the time that converts this, that takes, that absorbs this, um, this vapor 
and then uh, the vapor is liquefied. So they have always access to drinkable water. And this uh, would represent a, a prototype of this device. And uh, so we are collaborating with a, a group of experimentalists, uh, in particular, Omar Yagi, who is a colleague and friend of mine at Berkeley, General Electric. And uh, this is a project, as I told you, uh, funded by DARPA. And the, the final goal is really to, to deliver to DARPA a device that can um, produce drinkable water. But uh, the, the point is that at the end, inside this device, so here you have one of these sponges that really uh, absorbs uh, uh, water vapor. And uh, so natural organic frameworks of these materials uh, um, seem to be promising at extracting atmospheric water in the desert and produce potable water. And so the fundamental question, of course, this is a, um, is a problem that involves uh, a lot of different scales. So um, there is an engineering aspect. There is, uh, you have to, to have some uh, energy, um, which is uh, the idea is uh, that this should be solar energy because you are in the desert and hopefully there is a lot of sun. But the point is, if you use these sponges uh, to capture the, the water vapor, how does water uh, really interact uh, with the, the framework, the, sur the surface of the framework? And so um, how th does this happen at the molecular level? And understanding it at the molecular level, it's not just the curiosity, but uh, it also allows us to eventually design superior material. And so we are working in this uh, uh, project, as I told you, in collaboration with the, um, our colleague in Berkeley and General Electrics and DARPA. And uh, um, from the computational point of view, the idea is to, to really design the next generation absorbents for water harvesting. And this is a scheme that shows that, uh, so one starts from a database of structures that are already known, identifies these uh, um, building blocks, so the metal node, the linker, perform some of these uh, first principle calculations based on quantum mechanics, and from there um, predicts uh, water isotherms, so that shows uh, the, the water uptake as a function of the, the pressure. And then eventually um, create a lot of data that can be used to train some machine learning algorithm and uh, um, become predictive. And this is represented in this sort of cycle where there is really the the, the quantum chemistry, the uh, machine learning, the artificial intelligence, and uh, a self-sustained loop. So here I want to show you for this project, and uh, um, I will be finishing in not too long, um, the, the material that uh, um, um, already has been made in the laboratory of our colleague is this aluminum-based material. So there are these aluminum, um, so this is aluminum oxide, uh, um, actually aluminum OH groups, and these organic linkers. And again, it has this uh, uh, structure with this sort of uh, rods. And uh, this is the, how a uh, picture, the graph that shows uh, the water uptake as a function of the of the, um, this is the, um, um, the pressure of water and also the, the relative humidity. And, uh, um, and so of course uh, the DARPA would like us to produce a material that uh, works, uh, is effective at very low relative humidities because they, they want it to work in the desert. And so what one can study if we decide to stick with this particular material, can we look at different uh, organic uh, components? So we, we, we are constructed this live libraries for new uh, linkers and see if they can uh, improve the water uptake. And uh, the mechanism of how water binding sites are populated is very hard to decipher, but it's very important because it allows us eventually to understand the, the the performance of the material. So what is really important is to understand the evolution of the water structures in the MOF. And uh, theory and modeling on the computer can really help understanding our water binds and uh, uh, predict uh, new systems. And this is a, a project that, uh, as I said, we have done in collaboration with uh, Omar Yagi, DARPA, General Electric, and also a colleague of mine who is also a theorist, uh, Joachim Sauer, um, from the University of Humboldt in Berlin.
And so here, so what we have done, we have done the computations, our colleagues have done the experiment independently, and um, we have understand the molecule by molecule sequence of filling uh, the, the locations in these pores. So, and uh, the, the important role of the organic linkers in these uh, adsorptions. So they, they create uh, so they, they create some sort of hydrophilic pockets. Uh, so these are pockets in which the, the water goes and they are very happy to go because there is a, a, a constructive interaction. And uh, so the, the waters uh, bind in a strong way. So from these simulations, what we, what we have done, and this is a work performed by my students so so really um, understand the structure at the molecular level. So we have these components, the uh, aluminum oxide unit, the organic part, and uh, um, we 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 have built a data set of water binding energies with different uh, uh, linkers and uh, the, these nodes. And uh, um, we have built a, a large number of hypothetical MOF starting from a small number of linkers and, uh, and nodes. And this approach is used to, to score other new MOFs. So here, uh, I want to show really at the molecular level, if this is your local uh, structure of the um, sponge, we can from the computer see how the, the molecules of water, this molecule here is a water molecule, come in one at a time. And we really have information about the, the distances between the water molecule and the framework and the, the energies, the energetics needed for this binding. And so here you see the first water molecule, and then we have the second one. And uh, what basically this study has shown is that uh, the first water, when they come in, they bind to the framework and they create a sort of seed to which the subsequent waters uh, bind. So there is uh, this sort of water of carpet of water molecules uh, that uh, uh, forms uh, um, one at a time. And so here I want to show you, these are the, the results of the molecular simulations. So you see, you have your, your framework, now the, the blue polygons represent the, the aluminum, and then there are the gray uh, green areas, which are the organic components, and what the water molecules really enter one at a time, and they form this uh, sort uh, of carpet, this seeding of water. And um, of course, understanding this, as I said, is, is very important from a fundamental point of view, but also, um, allow us to eventually decide how to improve the material to make this process more effective. And, uh, and so, for example, moving forward, we want to make these uh, um, pockets more hydrophilic than they are. And so we are replacing, in this case, uh, the, this uh, linker, the original one, which is a pyrazole linker, with other five-member heterocyclic linker. And so this can all be done on the computer, and we can tell the experimentalists which of these uh, linkers uh, are more promising. Of course, I told you, uh, I mean, this is an incredible challenge, because I told you this little story, the one on the left, the molecular scale. But of course, once we have understood how the material works, the idea is then to um, to coat um, so to have it, this moth that coats uh, and then uh, um, computational fluid dynamics uh, is also important uh, and one has to make uh, um, this uh, sort of uh, composite material because of the the coating the moth coating then this moth is, is are taken are kept all together by polymers and uh, at the end one will make uh, um, this uh, this device that is the one that has to be delivered uh, to to DARPA and of course uh, as i said uh, um, my work is is here but these are this is work done by uh, engineers and people who have some specialty that uh, are, are very far from mine. So um, I like to cite a sentence by um, a professor from the University of Bologna, Vincenzo Balsani, is very famous. He said, uh, in the old days, the scientists knew, um, um, knew nothing of everything. We're talking about Leonardo da Vinci. He 
he was a scientist in many, many different ways. He knew a little bit of everything. Nowadays, the scientists know everything of nothing in the sense that uh, my work is very specialized on this little problem, which is very important, but to solve the real problem, we need to work in collaboration uh, at all these other scales with other specialists. So I want to tell you where are we going from the modeling. Uh, we really need to establish consistencies between different frameworks. We need, of course, to develop new methods, better methods to model more complex systems, uh, better algorithms also for the problems and algorithms that work on computers of tomorrow. I mean, there is the these quantum computers who represent uh, a real challenge for people who develop uh, uh, quantum methods because we want our methods to be ready for the computers of tomorrow. And also nowadays data are very important to so really um, collect a lot of uh, experimental data and computational data and uh, merge them together and make them work in a, a synergistic way is very important. Uh, I want just to conclude by telling that uh, um, uh, along the lines of what you have heard, we are trying to put together an initiative uh, which is called uh, um, Harvesting Dilute Resource from Air and Water. So this is a, a center that uh, a science and technology center Center funded by NSF. So we are um, trying to working towards in a proposal. And the lead institution is the University of Chicago. And of course, uh, this is not just the, about the, the science, it's to go from science to technology. So um, we, we have various aspects, uh, programmable materials, and this is to uh, dilute to, con to harvest dilute resources from both air and water. And of course, uh, the idea is to have partnerships uh, with industrial colleagues, uh, but also to, um, to have an aspect of cost, uh, sustainability of this initiative. And we're trying to involve also people in the Chicago area because water is the very, even if we have the lakes, uh, the, the problem of being water depleted is important for the entire world and probably the the, the, the lakes area will become a refugee um, destination in the future. This will not be war refugees. This will be climate refugees. So if there are people who want to be somehow involved in these initiatives, it would be great. I want to finish by acknowledging uh, uh, this is my group at the University of Chicago. And uh, really, I'm just the face of the group. They do all the work the funding agencies, and uh, it's a very international group, and this is beautiful. And for the projects I talked about today, I'd like to uh, thank my colleague Omar Yagi at Berkeley. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm very happy to take them. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's, really, it's really fascinating to me to, um, as like non, and not an expert at all to learn about these, you know, practices and like uh, this work that you do at the literally at the molecular level, because we always think about systems at the more, you know, like visible and like the bigger scale, but like what really happens um, at the molecular scale is also absolutely fascinating. Um, so as we wait for some questions to come in, um, I wanted to um, ask about the project that you did with DARPA again. I was really curious about, uh, you know, the timeline uh, because when we when we see presentations like this, it's always um, hard to understand how much work is behind that kind of project. And so, like, more or less, how how long did it take between, you know, you first developed the model uh, in like the the computational model and the time the prototype was actually created so uh actually so uh, we are still in um in progress but darpa uh, gave us the three years total so with darpa mm. um the deadlines are are are, are, are very tight with other um, um 
agencies like the Department of Energy, National Science Foundation. These are more long-term projects and we don't have to deliver um, so, so fast. But uh, with DARPA, they really, so there is a commitment to have a deliverable. And uh, um, now we are in year two. And at the end of year two, the first prototype has to be delivered. It will not yet meet the metrics. So the, there are part, there are specific metrics, like for example, it has to work at a relative humidity of, um, of maybe 11%, which is, is really low. It means that it has, and probably the, the prototype that will be ready by then will maybe be 14 or 15 so it's not but uh, and uh, I, I have to tell you my my part of the of this project is only for the first two years because uh, it's more on the fundamental and theoretical part the last year will be exclusively on the engineering part in the in creating this device and um, but the other thing is that for example they they say okay now you have the material the one that i showed that um, is performs at 11 uh, percent relative humidity mm -hmm. but the next uh, breakthrough the next quantum jump would be if we could make a material that performs at five percent relative humidity and so to do that uh, we really have to i mean it's not enough to make incremental changes in what we have now mm -hmm. and change a little we, the idea is think about something completely different, uh, even um, unpredictable, and to do that maybe using artificial intelligence or exploring chemical spaces that otherwise one would have not uh, explored uh, uh, may be important. So, but to, to give you an idea, it's a three-year project, and after three years, uh, they they hope to have something that they can really utilize for their um, for their army. But the idea is that, that maybe in three years it's for the army, but Maybe in 10 years, we will all carry one of, of these little devices. It's like a water bottle. Instead of going to the gym with my water bottle, I will have my, my little device. Uh, of course, maybe I, I don't need it yet, but uh, that's the idea that it's not just for um, military purposes, but also for societal purposes. Right. Um, so I see some questions coming in. So I'll start with uh, going in order and try to tackle as many as we can. Um, so the first one from Vincent says, how does it feel to be working at University of Chicago in the footstep of Enrico Fermi? I think this is a uh, beautiful question. Hi, Vincent. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I feel very humble and uh, I, I hope um, I... I mean, uh, um, I, I, I am at, uh, I can des I deserve to be here, but it's certainly a very um, stimulating environment because there is all the tradition, as you said, Rico Fermi and all this. But uh, there is also there are a lot of modern initiatives, the quantum initiatives, and these uh, uh, energy, clean, uh, clean energy, water initiatives. So um, it's really a very stimulating uh, uh, environment. Um, and then there is Matteo, has VR influenced at all computation practices for scientific application? What is VR, Matteo? Can you type it? Oh, I think it's um, virtual reality. Ah, okay, virtual reality. So um, I think that uh, uh, at the moment, uh, I mean, I, in chemistry, I don't know what we do is virtual, right? <laughs> so, mm. so it's all virtual. So in this respect, uh, uh, yes. Um, but uh, it's certainly a direction in which there may be uh, development. And now there is Chris Kramer, by the way, he's my husband. So thank you very much, <laughs> husband. And by the way, he's American, but uh, he's an Italian citizen. Il console, the console uh, made him become an Italian citizen last year. <laughs> So how uh, does it compare the US, Switzerland and Italy? They are very different realities. Uh, uh, I'm still very Italian, uh, but um, I think that uh, what is important when somebody um, has these opportunities uh, to work in different countries is to, to understand different cultures and um, try to adapt, but also uh, keep a memory and uh, keep uh, one own identity. Um, and then there is Gardenia. Will you update results for public knowledge? Please let the public know about your project. Yes, so we, um, some of the work has already been published in scientific journals. There, there are some, um, there is some degree of confidentiality because uh, there are various teams that work on this. So we are not the only team. There are, they are funding maybe five different teams. 
we have meetings, um, public meetings, but and we present part of the results, but just certainly um, um, you, you will see it. Uh, Vincent, uh, can you say something about the computational resources that are required to simulate these processes and mechanisms? So these are, uh, yes, um, they are um, rather high performance computers. Um, and so they are available, for example, at the University of Chicago, there is this research computational center, but there are also national um, resources. You know, in the old days, uh, computers were super expensive. Nowadays, they are much less. And so in principle, you can think about uh, um, an assembly of um, many computers like my laptop, maybe with more memory, more um, disk, the more powerful disk. But um, uh, these simulations become more and more affordable nowadays. So may maybe they take time, but uh, um, the resources are there. And this is also one of the reasons why why computational chemistry, computational material science have advanced so much. It's a rel these are relatively new disciplines in the sense that the, the fundamental laws of quantum mechanics were known already 100 years ago, but uh, they couldn't do anything because they were too complicated to be solved on a computer. This is what, on a, sorry, on a piece of paper. This is what Dirac said in 1929 when he got his Nobel Prize. But then in the 60s, uh, the, there has been a big boom of computer and the field really has, um, has developed uh, um, extremely fast. Nowadays, uh, uh, one aspect that is important, I mean, it's a data science society. So one aspect that probably is more important is what to do with all this data, how to store them and how to access them. And uh, how, how valuable is it to store them and uh, make them accessible rather than, for example, having to regenerate them? Um, I don't see other questions. Um, yeah, so if well, there- th Thank yeah. you so much. And uh, I mean, if you just Google my name, you will find me um, on the University of Chicago website or on Twitter. So please feel free to contact me uh, anytime. Great. Um, and thank you, Professor Gagliardi. And I want to thank, thank you, of course, thank our you so much. Council too. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Gagliardi. Let me tell you that uh, having been the one who uh, signed the citizenship of your husband. <laughs> and so, as a small contribution to the well-being of your family, I will claim credits on the success of your research. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. No, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking just to, to say thank you. Thank you for this presentation. It's uh, absolutely speechless. Uh, and thank you for your work. Thank you so much. Uh, take care. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.